Hi there. I'm here with my mother as well. So she says hello. Yeah. Pleasure. Looking forward yeah. to it. So fantastic. So without further ado, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I'm Dr. Agatha Caraballo. I'm the founding director of the Maurice A. Ferre Institute for Civic Leadership in the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs at Florida International University. Um, this, this is the first installment of our Spring 2022 Civic Leadership and Service Series, and we're really excited to be joined this evening by David Lawrence, Jr., who we'll introduce in just a moment. The Maurice A. Ferre Institute for Civic Leadership is a new institute in the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs that was launched last May, and our mission is to promote civic engagement and leadership, community infrastructure, and social justice through our academic, research, and community programs. So one of our outreach is to have these dynamic speakers to come in and talk about civic leadership and public service. This semester, we're partnering with the Jack D. Gordon Public Institute for Public Policy on their FIU Policy Lab to address issues that were submitted by different legislators. And we're also partnering with the Department of Public Policy and Administration in their Integrative Seminar in Public Policy um, course, which this is the capstone course that the students pursuing the Bachelors of Public Policy and Service um, pursue before they graduate. So we're really excited to bring in these speakers um, to talk about these issues and to answer any questions and just allow for this opportunity to engage with some of our community leaders. I'm excited to introduce this evening's uh, guest speaker, David Lawrence Jr. And with that, I'm also gonna um, introduce Natalia Zaya, who is our course assistant for the class and also works with uh, David at the Children's Trust. Welcome Natalia and welcome David. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm just gonna briefly read um, just a little snippet of his bio and then we'll post the full bio in the chat. So David Lawrence Jr. is the retired publisher of the Miami Herald. He's also the founder of the Children's Movement of Florida and the board chairman of the board for the Children's Trust. Some of you may recognize his name from the K through eight educational center right outside of the Biscayne Bay campus. So if you have gone there and the name sounds familiar, um, he's definitely an icon in this community and is somebody that we're very excited um, to join us this evening. I actually had the pleasure of having him as a speaker, I guess it was about six or seven years ago um, for a corporate responsibility summit. So I know that you guys are really in for a treat. It's gonna be very interactive this evening. Uh, so you will have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, we'll start off with some questions and then towards the ending, um, we'll allow you to either raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question on camera or you can post in the chat and we'll be happy to read the question for you. David, thank you so much again for joining us. Um, can I can I fix can I fix one thing in the inter, in the introduction? Yes, please. Sorry. Uh, and and you know the the answer to this, but but it just got said wrong. Uh, I am not the chair of the Children's Trust. I was the founding chair, and I do not want the present day chair Ken Hoffman to feel left out in any way. He's a great guy. Okay, go ahead. My apologies. <laughs> no problem. Natalia, is there anything that you would like to join? Um, we're gonna also, again, just post the full bio in the chat. Uh, so if you haven't had the opportunity to read his bio, definitely, um, it's very extensive. Uh, so we're not gonna waste too much time going through, just know that he's a very um, dynamic member of our community that has made a tremendous impact, not only in the lives of children in Miami-Dade County, but throughout Florida. So would it help, uh, Professor, if I gave a little more in the way of what I think is might be significant about myself. Absolutely. I was 80 in 47 days. Uh, I am as vigorous as I think I was many, many, many years ago. I'm involved in too much, but I'm not saving my energy for the next world. I live a life and have lived my own life with optimism and idealism. And sometimes that's a bit naive, but you get more, more done that way. Uh, I've been married for 58 years. Uh, we have five children, 57 to 36. Um, and um, I'm blessed. I play no golf, no tennis. I read at least two books a week, mostly history and biographies or books about racism, prejudice, anti-Semitism, et cetera. 
because I believe it, quote, can happen again and so forth. So, uh, and I live in the most interesting community in the United States of America. I'm ready. I agree, there is no place like Florida. <laughs> Uh, well, it's not just Florida, it's particularly Miami or- Miami-Dade County, that's absolutely- I'd, I'd, also, I'd also say this, um, because I think it's deeply warranted. Uh, when you talk about public service in Miami and beyond, the Ferre family quickly comes to mind. I, I think they have been treasures in this community, not only um, Maurice Ferre, uh, not only the children, an extraordinary partner in Mercedes Ferre. So it is a privilege to talk under this rubric. So thank you. Absolutely. And for those of you that maybe are new to Florida and don't um, have as much background knowledge about um, Maurice Ferre, Maurice Ferre was the mayor of Miami during some of its most formative years, um, a former county commission and state legislator um, before becoming mayor from 1973 to 1985. During some of Miami's, again, very formative years, um, very challenging times, but his legacy of civic leadership and service um, and servant leadership is something that we can only hope to emulate and pass on and inspire the next generation of leaders. Okay, let's have some questions. Awesome. So I'm gonna start off with a question specifically related to our civic leadership and public service series. Um, and that does, what does public service mean to you? Um, and how would you define it within the context of the various positions that you've held? Well, I serve on a lot of different boards and places. Uh, I am, for instance, a life member of the NAACP and have been for 40 years. Uh, I serve on boards that devoted to immigration, to children with special needs, to early childhood. I serve on two different university boards. Um, and I have a lifelong challenge is that if you ask me to do something and you give me enough advance warning, I will say yes. I may at some points regret I said yes, but, uh, but I do say yes. Um, and. And I try to live my life by what Horace Mann, who was more or less the inventor of American public education, uh, said uh, more than 150 years ago to the graduating, graduating class at Antioch College in Ohio, quote, be ashamed to die before you have won some battle for humanity. And, and another name that comes to mind who is actually a really lousy human being was the first Henry Ford who, if you look him up, you'll find that he had a lot of, if you'll pardon this, crap in his soul. But he once said, if you think you can do a thing or think you cannot do a thing, you can. The point being that there is enormous power within each of us to make a difference. And if you think you're a serf, well, you'll probably be a serf. But the great stories in human history are of individuals, some of whose names we don't know, who maybe paid a heck of a price for it, uh, but understood what Frederick Douglass understood 150 plus years ago, which is you don't make any progress without some pushing and shoving. So if you think of social progress throughout history, goodwill is important, but the lesson of history and social progress is it took, it took some shoving, took some pushing. Uh, and that could be women's suffrage, which has only came to be 101, 102 years ago, or it could be uh, Medicare, it could be Social Security, it could be gay rights, it could be the civil rights movement and so forth and, and so on. And what we might have thought about as, quote, radical at one point or another ultimately becomes... Uh, the part of the foundation of this country and, and the world. The other name I remember from high school, uh, and I went, I have a full public education. I'm one of nine children. All nine of us were graduated from a state university in Florida um, in, a, in a time when we did not have the, the resources to, uh, to do to have any other choices, but uh, 
I've always lived my life on the basis that, uh, yeah, I'm a bit insecure and I'm nervous at times, but I think that's kind of healthy if you have the chutzpah to go ahead and, and do something. So what's your life ultimately mean? Now I am, I'm far closer to the end than the beginning and regret I won't even have more time now that I have some wisdom but the, the life does not have anything to do with what did I own. Uh, life has to do with how did I help somebody else? What difference did I make? Uh, and it doesn't need to be some giant building a movement. Uh, it is so frequently a difference you made in one other person's life. And I couldn't agree more. Um, really, we're all so privileged, especially in education, to make an impact and to inspire and to help people achieve their goals. Um, and one thing as we think about, you know, that everybody can make a difference, everybody can make an impact. I, I thought of one of my favorite um, quotes, and again, to paraphrase from Martin Luther King Jr. Day yesterday, is everybody can be great because everyone can be, you know, can serve. Um, you know, and finding the different ways that we all can make an impact in our community. And speaking of impact, what was the motivation behind um, founding the children's movement? Well, it really starts before then. Um, I was in the newspaper business for 35 years, at seven newspapers, and led a life. I was managing it of a newspaper by the time I was 27. I led a life that I got to go to 56 different countries and not just tourist places. Uh, I talked about micro lending in a village in Bangladesh and interviewed the uh, child rape victims in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, had a life where I interviewed Fidel Castro for five and a half hours. Um, had dinner with Queen Elizabeth. Have met every president and had a conversation with every president of one length or another from Nixon through uh, Joe Biden. Um, um, so you, you cannot lead that kind of life without some sacrifices, but, but I think I had my priorities straight. And in 1996, the governor of Florida was Lawton Childs, a very decent, moral, uh, human being. And he asked me to lead a statewide task force on early childhood. Well, I'd never even heard of the subject. Um, and so I did it when I was still publisher of the Herald and did it for two years. And what I learned, among other things, that 85% of brain growth occurs by the age of three. And uh, if you have 100 children at the end of first grade who are poor readers at the end of fourth grade, 88 of the 100 are still poor readers and so forth. And um, it made me decide to retire and work full time on these kinds of issues. In 1988, as a matter of history, uh, a woman named Janet Reno, later to become the longest serving attorney general of the United States and from Miami, and then uh, the state attorney in what was then called Dade County, led an effort with others to pass something that we now call the Children's Trust. Well, it failed two to one. Uh, she argued we ought to help children over here and here and here, meaning almost stereotypically impoverished, disadvantaged, minorities, etc. Well, 14 years later, I led a campaign, a very different kind of campaign, and argued it was about everyone's child, which is to say the same principles that raised my five children are the same things that all children need, the right blend of health and education and nurturing and love. And we passed it two to one instead of losing it two to one, but we put a five year sunset on it and said, try it for five years. If you don't like it, dump it. So five years comes up in, the, in August of 2008. Well, if you remember that time, we, the great recession was going on and since Miami is a get rich quick place, it's a get poor quick place as well. That's the history of this part of the world. And this time we passed it with 85.4% of the vote. Does that mean that people love children in Miami-Dade, which is itself larger than 16 states in the union, 
than they did in 1988, well, that couldn't be possible. Uh, it's called the Children's Trust because trust is the great issue in Miami-Dade, in Florida, and for that matter, the United States of America. And do I trust you to spend my money, and it is other people's money, and that now throws off this very year, somewhere north of $170 million in one American community, county, and think of the difference you can make in higher quality after school care, higher quality um, early learning and child care, or programs that attempt to break the cycle of, of um, uh, inmates, in turn having children who will be inmates. Uh, likewise, I work with Mayor Pinellas to pass a pre-K for four-year-olds. We were only the third state in the country to do this. Uh, and we argued that this was something should be available to every child in the state. And there are now 150,000 plus four-year-olds in the program. A movement, in, from my definition, is about everyone. So I will frequently ask it on it, what was the civil rights movement about? And invariably, I'll get an answer. Well, it was about minorities, Black people, African Americans, et cetera. I said, no, you got it all wrong. It's about an American sense of equity for everyone. And that was the principle that we, uh, you can't build a movement based on those people or those children. You need to build a movement based on us and ours, all of us. So iconic to say the least, um, and it's amazing to hear how all of these leaders, um, including yourself, were able to come through and have such a tremendous impact and a legacy that impacts just hundreds of thousands of children and will, you know, eventually millions, um, you know, for years and years to come. So I definitely applaud you for that. And I mean, it's incredible to see that with, um, again, it's also the framing, you know, and as we kind of know, sometimes it's, how things are presented to the public and whether or not um, they'll be able to get that buy-in. Well, that's an important point because I come from journalism and it's about storytelling. Yeah. And, and it's about telling stories. Uh, stories about what you would want for your own family, for your own children. And how does somebody else's family relate to my own and or yours and, and we have much more in common than so many people realize. Speaking of which, uh, as your role as the former publisher of the Miami Herald, what do you see as the um, the media's role in um, as a government watchdog, if you will, and their role in public accountability and transpar transparency? Well, I'm not a terribly optimistic human being at this point about what's going on. Uh, I think most of print journalism, particularly in newspapers, has been shredded. I think there is going to come a time when, maybe I won't be alive, but it won't be that long from now, when the only newspapers I'm pretty sure will deliver a newspaper every day are called the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. Um, I, I still get the, the New York Times and the Miami Herald on my doorstep, as it were, seven days a week, although the Herald now is only six days a week in print. I get the Wall Street Journal on Saturday. I look at a lot of apps. I read Politico. I read Axios, et cetera. So this is the world of information. But the reality is that people now see two things on an iPhone. Oh, I know what's going on in America or in my own community. What do I most want from the Herald, for instance? I don't need so much coverage from about Afghanistan or Syria or tsunamis. I can get that a bunch of places. What I want to know is who's doing what and negative and positive in my own community. That's what I depend on. And I think there is in its own way, more bias than has ever been in my lifetime. And I, for instance, pay a lot of money to get the New York Times, but I see its bias. Uh, it's quite obvious in, in my estimation. Um, the bias can be not just an editorial page bias, it can be how things are written, how they're, quote, played, unquote, in the newspaper and whatever else. 
And I grew up in a time when I can remember when there were four network stations. And I'll bet that no one on this call knows number four, and you know ABC, CBS, and NBC, but there was a network called Dumont, D-U-M-O-N-T, way in the early days of, of television. Uh, so we all watched, to some degree, the evening news. Uh, and, and an informed citizen, in my estimation, got his or her news from a number of different places and made up his or her own mind about whatever and then went and voted. We now live in a world where she's an MSNBC person and he's a, uh, he's a Fox person. Uh, that's not helpful for society. Uh, I, I'm looking for sober-sided news coverage, uh, not from just one place, but that this place, this place, this place, and then I can make up my own mind. Um, is there um, fake news, false news? I'm on Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook. I see all kinds of sophisticated sorts of things that are actually in error or deliberately false. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm more worried about this republic than I ever have been. Uh, it's very tribal. I believe we need to be somewhere toward the center. I believe we need to make room respectfully uh, for all 330 million American people. Uh, we're not going to get there uh, because some people hate other people. So I'm not talking about the far left or the far right. I'm talking about both of them. Okay. That that's related to this, um, and I think you touched upon it, Dave. But um, uh, in the chat, we have someone had written: "Has journalism lost its objectivity in favor of political bias?" Is there anything okay, else? Okay, so so I have for years and years and years spoken on the subject, and I have I have asked audiences of varying sizes how many of you consider yourself objective in this room, and I'm talking about going back decades. And, and so these people will raise their hand, this, 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 and this person, and I, and, I, uh, and I say to them, you're the really dangerous people in the room. No one on this call this evening is objective. The best people on this call are people who realize what their biases are and then work to mitigate them, diminish them, et cetera. So, it's all based on who was mom and who was dad. Did we have both mom and dad? What did we read? Where did we go to school? What was the faith component of our lives and so forth? Um, whom did we spend time with? Um, and realizing your biases is, is, the, is the path to salvation and then working hard to make sure that, that they don't um, diminish the the pursuit of integrity. I worry deeply about people who think they have found the truth. Uh, I think that is a lifelong pursuit. And the fact that you have gotten facts doesn't mean you have the truth. Well, which facts did you use? What's the headline? What's the picture with it? How is it displayed in the newspaper or on television? What's the quote lead story and so forth? There's bias all over. There's always been bias. Uh, but now I think there is quite deliberate bias. And that's not healthy for the republic which we love. Also, um, another question that's in the chat that when you're speaking about division and, and that this what's happening in media, this was an interesting one. Chloe Little in the chat wrote, Today, I came across an opinion editorial published by Al Jazeera that insists that the United States is on the brink of another uncivil war, another civil war with un in parentheses. I would love to hear Mr. Lawrence's perspective on this proclamation. Well, an intelligent person is getting information from a, a bunch of different places. And so I don't see it regularly, but, but I'm interested in what Al Jazeera covers 
And I think I need to know what other people think, but I don't even need to go to Al Jazeera to find all sorts of competing perspectives on what, on what the news is. As for civil wars, uh, my gosh, we live in a country with 400 million weapons. Do you understand that? I'm not talking about military weapons. I'm talking about people with guns of one sort or another. You saw what was attempted to happen at a synagogue in Texas the other day. You saw what happened at the Tree of Life synagogue in, in um, Pittsburgh in the past couple of years. Uh, you can see it all, all over. Do, do we have a vast and significant problem of people not getting along and other people feel disenfranchised? Now, um, if I'm saying things that offend you, just say, God, the guy's almost 80. He is losing it in America. But when Donald Trump got elected in 2016, I'm lying in bed with my wife and I am saying out loud, what don't I know about America that this could happen? Um, and I've come to believe there are an enormous number of people who feel angry, disenfranchised, out of the loop. They don't care about me, et cetera, et cetera. Then you add to that, the, uh, and social media is an enormous ingredient in this. You real, all, read all sorts of supportive words of people who uh, are one shade of, of some form of supremacy or another. Uh, we got something deeply precious in this country. Uh, and we could lose it. There is no guarantee of anything. And if you read American history, you don't have to read very far to see what we've messed up. Now, if you come away saying I'm an unpatriotic American, then you have no idea who I am. But look at what happened in 1953 in Iran. Look what happened in 1954 in Guatemala. Look what happened with the dirty wars. Look what happened with Patrice Lumumba in, in the Congo in the early 60s. Uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, the 1924 Immigration Act, the Know Nothing Movement, um, and so forth and so on. We've made progress, significant progress, but we're a long way from the promised land of being genuinely inclusive and respectful of all the human beings in this country. And, and uh, I see some real pluses for social media. I can find out things lickety split, but I could also find out things lickety split that uh, are absolutely wrong. And I see it every day. And I'm optimistic about what can be, but uh, I think we need to face up to the to the challenge. I had thought, incidentally, that when Joe Biden get elected, got elected, that that would be that would lower the temperatures in this country. Hadn't lowered them at all. Uh, and to have an extraordinary number of people, to have sixty percent of the people in one party say Joe Biden lost the election. Well, my gosh, what is happening to us? Uh, when are we going to get to back to, quote, real facts? Um, and I don't want to give you the sense that I'm pessimistic. I'm fundamentally optimistic. Along those lines, um, I would like to ask for those students that are hoping to affect change in their communities, any advice? Do you have any questions for uh, for students or just community members who are hoping to make an impact or, or a positive change in their communities? Well, I, I, I fundamentally think that there is such power in the individual, uh, but I want people to, to really learn and really read and be a lifelong reader. So students are in classrooms or on Zoom classrooms 
and you have things to read and various obligations. Uh, what are you going to do about learning when you're decades from now? Uh, one of the greatest joys of my life is, is learning. Uh, Einstein talked about when you stop learning, you start dying. Um, there's such a joy and, and the, all the students on here, all of us, frankly, uh, are going to make a difference partly by understanding how to build relationships. I've never wanted any of our five children to be too good looking or too smart or too charismatic because they would try to get by on those gifts. Uh, I want them to understand uh, how to be a lifelong learner, how to believe in themselves, uh, how to make a difference in their own community and their country. Uh, I have someone I mentor and have for almost seven years. He's 17 years old now. He's been shot on two different occasions. He's been shot at total of three times. He loves sports. And at one point he was just planning to go, uh, hope he'd go to the NBA. Well, there are only 450 people dribbling the ball in the NBA and that's probably not going to happen. And I said, pretend you're at a White House state dinner. I said, I've been to a couple of those. You're seated between a famous United States Senator, a famous author. What the hell are you gonna talk about? Uh, because it turns out, that they don't have never heard of LeBron James or Dwayne Wade or, or whatever. Um, I have a lot of conversations with people on the basis of how do you connect with people? If I've been to Auschwitz, which I have with a Mengele twin, I can have a certain kind of conversation. If I've talked to Muhammad Yunus about uh, micro lending, which I have, I sort of understand that. Uh, Every country I go to, I read literature. I read geopolitics. Uh, I understand the geography. Um, so I can ask good questions when I can. A real lifelong learner building relationships uh, is going to have an extraordinary life of given to other folks. If you go back to Maurice Ferre, just as one example, Here's a man who read deeply all his life. And when he ran for X or Y or Z, and he ran for a number of things during his lifetime, he was able to talk on any level. Uh, and I think people are privileged to learn. So uh, I don't want to get into deep trouble in this conversation, but there is such a thing, for instance, as white privilege. I grew up on a farm which went broke. Uh, I'm one of nine children. Uh, I can remember uh, butter and sugar sandwiches, which I do not think is on any health list, including in my childhood. Uh, but I've been more blessed than most. I don't consider myself rich, but I'm well off. Uh, I've been able to take advantage of education in the United States of America. Uh, I've never had to worry, what does this mean, the, the skin color? I've never been racially profiled as far as I know. Uh, I need to face, for this country to make progress, genuine progress, and overcome pain and predilection of one sort or another. You need to confront yourself. You'll never make enough progress until you confront yourself. And that's what learning is all about. If I can um, uh, piggyback on that, I have a couple of um, questions regarding reading in the chat. Um, one question was, what are three books that Mr. Lawrence would recommend to students considering a career in civil rights? Is Isabel Wilkerson's cast one of them? The answer is Isabel Wilkerson's cast is one of them. When I went to Detroit, remember, many of the people here won't know this, but the newspaper business was once a very powerful business. So I was in Detroit. We had several hundred thousand circulation. But when I went there in 1978, 
we had four minority professionals on the staff in a majority black city. By the time I left, 11 years later, we had the highest percentage of minority professionals of any urban newspaper in America. We lowered no standards. You don't need to lower standards of any sort. We hired high quality people. One of the quality people we hired in her first real newspaper job was a woman named Isabel Wilkerson, who later wrote The Warmth of Other Sons, which is an important, engaging book. And she wrote uh, the, the book Cast, which is about racism through the prism of black and white in America, Nazi Germany and the Jews, and India and the Dalits or the quote untouchables, close quote. So a very important book a very different way to look at the subject. Another book I'd recommend to you that, that I read recently was um, uh, The 1619 Project. It's been very controversial, but it's an important book and well worth reading and you don't need to agree with everything. Or recently I read a book called uh, The Last King of America, The Misunderstood Reign of George III. Well, if you read the Declaration of Independence, you see the opening words written by Thomas Jefferson with some editing, and then you see a bill of indictment of King George III. So if you grow up in America, you learn hateful guy, bad guy, did us wrong, et cetera. Well, there's a wonderful new autobiography of King George by Andrew Roberts, who not long before wrote the best one volume biography of recent years of Winston Churchill. Turns out that King George was actually a pretty good guy with pretty good attitudes. Uh, I, I, need, I need to learn a whole bunch of different kinds of things. And uh, I get much of my joy from, from learning and connecting with other people. I, I host a book group in my home for people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. 25 people meet in this room because uh, I want them to understand history. So one of the books we read is by uh, Volker Ulrich, a German, translated. And there were two volumes. This first volume, it's about 750 pages. It's, it is, it's called Hitler Ascent. 1889, 1939, first 50 years of his life. What did I want people to learn? That Hitler came to power legally. It wasn't the stormtroopers who brought him in. Came to power legally, the business community said, well, he's better than the communists. Uh, and we can control him. Well, they couldn't control him. And 60 million people died in World War II. Uh, I want people to understand how did history come to be so we don't have to, to, to repeat these kinds of mistakes. And we are in real peril of repeating of mistakes. And I want to thank uh, Chloe Little um, for her question. She's one of our Frey Institute fellows and actually the chair of our communications committee. So thank you, Chloe. We're going to move on to another question, and actually, I'm going to move to Angela Mott and um, allow her to ask her question to you. Do I get to see her picture? <laughs> oh, there's Angela. Okay. Hi, good evening, Mr. Lawrence. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to just hear of the breadth of all of your life experiences. Um, I can't even imagine all the changes that you've seen in our country. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, I have a question, it's fairly long, but um, my, my question is, I understand the importance of a narrative of access to early childhood education for all. Um, at the same time, we know that access to education is not equitable for all communities. For example, our immigrant communities, socioeconomically depressed, um, our racial minorities and our racial minorities in rural areas. So no, not everyone starts at the same starting line. And um, I believe the civil rights movement of the 60s hinged on those disenfranchised communities um, as a way to show that if we change how, how these communities are treated, then the entire country would be, would be better. 
So how does your work in your book um, speak to justice? I know that's part of the title, speak to justice for these communities of children. And after all of this time, where do you still see that we have work to do? So I would say first, Angela, it's not just access, it's access to quality, it's not slots. So there are lots of slots. We have, for instance, in this community alone, we have 1,400 licensed childcare sites. Um, and many others, we don't even know uh, where they are. It's sort of underground. Uh, and maybe a grandmother is taking in five kids to do whatever. So only real quality brings real outcomes. Uh, Childcare is a deeply challenged business economically. And in fact, what, we, what has happened during the pandemic is an extraordinary number of childcare sites and centers have closed. Uh, there is enormous attention to this issue in a way that it wasn't true of, uh, just a relatively few years ago. Uh, when I started in the end of the 90s, there were 17 licensed child care, uh, 17 accredited child care centers in this community. Accreditation means you have some emblem that you've earned that it is of higher quality. Well, uh, that 17 is now 500. Uh, so I'm not telling you that miracles have been done in a day or a week or a year, but progress has, has been made. One of the challenges here is for people to know, well, what is quality? And most people, I see it in my own children who have children. They're all college educated. Uh, and they have children, uh, three children with children. And what people tend to look for is what does it cost how close is it to my home or work? And, and, and will my child be safe at the end of the day? Those are all legitimate questions. But how do I know it's a stimulating environment? That's where, among other things, accreditation comes in. There's just far more emphasis now on it. But I am not telling you, Angela, that we are right on top of the promised land, because we are not. Uh, but uh, Frankly, this community, I've spoken in more than half the states in the past years. Uh, I don't know if you realize what a big deal the Children's Trust is. It's enormous. So when I've spoken in Fresno, California, or, or St. Paul, Minnesota, et cetera, uh, wow, you can do that in Miami? Uh, and they're not quite sure that Miami is a part of the United States of America frequently. That was, I'm being slightly facetious here, and I want you to take it in that spirit. Uh, so we've made a lot of progress, but progress is mostly evolutionary, not revolutionary. We built a stronger foundation. We have far more parents knowing and asking about quality. I had lunch yesterday with somebody who's got two very young children. And she is, uh, she's smart, college educated, has a good career, uh, and she doesn't like her childcare facility at all. She's in Palm Beach County. So she came to me and one of the questions is, how do I find out? Well, I'm connecting with her with somebody. Uh, but you gotta know enough to know that some of this is really good and some not so good. And so, Part of it's one by one and part of it is much larger. Awesome, thank you. Um, our next Please. question comes from Marja Estrada. Maybe. Hi, hello. Hi. Um, I would like to ask um, your opinion on uh, a matter of um, where our society is being driven given the circumstances, the socio-political circumstances that we're living, um, would you say that aside from the lack of inclusivity and tolerance, our history has presented over and over again, 
Another issue affecting the current social political situation in the USA could be a lack of proper civil and academic education. And I say this because I've noticed that, in my opinion, there is a lack of um, knowledge about our country's history. Um, as you were saying before, I think it's important that all of us get familiar with what mistakes we have made before so that we can avoid continue making them. And I think a lot of people don't understand everything that had happened in our country's history. So we just say that I am correct to assume that we actually need to work more into learning in, you know, history and how to... Um, First of all, Mara, do you, how do you pronounce your name? Marja. M A R. I have J in front of me. M A R J A, and you pronounce it what? Marja. Oh, Marja. Okay. Where are you from? I'm originally Cuban. Okay. And how old were you when you came to this country? Not that long ago. I was 25. I'm okay. 31. Well, your English is getting damn good, just so you know. So you ought to be proud of yourself. Um, the reality is that we have an extraordinary number of people in Miami-Dade who are from elsewhere. We have the highest percentage of foreign born of any urban area in the United States of America. Uh, and while there are an extraordinary number of Cubans, the Cubans are only half of the Hispanic population here. So there are huge blocks of Nicaraguans and Colombians, et cetera. And no community, as you know, is monolithic. So I grew up in a time when on the top of the blackboard, they don't have blackboards anymore, were pictures of Washington and Lincoln. So I grew up and I had a strong sense of history and of my own community, my state, my nation. We have an extraordinary number of people who might come from Cuba or El Salvador or Haiti or Jamaica or Guyana or China or whatever else. So the answer to your question is you're totally right. And we need to place far more emphasis on people knowing what the heritage and history of this country is. I also have an obligation to know about heritage and history in other places, but I want people to understand how did this place get to the place it is? Uh, how did slavery come to be? What is reconstruction? Uh, what happened with immigration? Um, how about the red scares in this country? Uh, the list goes on and on. There's an important new book called The Good War. And it's by a West Point professor named Elizabeth Salmon. And the book fundamentally is about World War II. Well, if you grow up in this country, you'll read that Tom Brokaw wrote a book called The Greatest Generation. And you'll read that it was a glorious time and everybody was together and we were fighting evil. Believe me, it's nowhere near that simple, but I understand the larger thing. Well, what's the thesis of the book? The thesis of the book is that we came out of World War II deeply full of ourselves and what we could do. And what's that ultimately led to? Vietnam, 58,000 Americans were dead and at least a million Vietnamese. Uh, we have spent $2 trillion in Afghanistan to bring democracy there. I do not think we have succeeded in that or, or will succeed in Iraq to bring democracy there. We're very, very, very well-intentioned people uh, but we at times have been significantly full of ourselves and, and have thought we know what's best for other people. And frankly, sometimes we do not. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think life is simple anywhere, whether it's Cuba or the United States of America. I need to learn a lot about Cuba. Uh, so I've been to Cuba four times as a journalist. Um, I recently saw um, a, a very good Netflix show called Cuba and the Cameraman. If you haven't seen it, it's worthwhile your seeing. 
I read a book not long ago by Anthony De Palma called The Cubans, What's Life Like for Ordinary Everyday Cubans? Uh, and, and none of the answers are um, fully easy. Uh, I know what despotism is. I know what freedom is. I know who has it and who does not, but it's still complicated. And the more I know about any particular country, beginning with my own, the better citizen I can be in there. So yes, a lot more understanding of history and civics. And I worry that people don't know much civic, don't know much history about their own country or anybody else's and what happened and what's the continuum? How does it fit, fit together? Uh, and it does if you, if you look at it as a, as a continuum and you have the facts to accompany that. Thank well, you. That's a great segue into Tafari Torres question. Tafari, if you wanted to go ahead and ask your question, if you're here. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, let me see you. Okay, I got you, Tafari. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so I had a I had a question on. Um, I know you've done a lot uh, to to you know better uh, the education of children K through 12 and stuff. And uh, I was just wondering, in your view, what does a like a proper education look for uh, students? You know, in going through the K through 12 system. Uh, I've heard speakers in the past. Um, they, they're more focused on STEM education, and while I think that's a big part of uh, like a proper education for, for a child, I think that um, an emphasis on, on the social sciences as well uh, should be placed. And I was just wondering what your metrics look like. Like, what does a, a well-educated child look like in the future? Okay, so first of all, I want you to consider the whole area of early childhood and early learning and brain growth and so forth. Tafari, I hope from time to time, including in the classroom and other places, that you're a little nervous and uptight and insecure. Are you? That would be healthy yeah, if you okay. are, Tafari. Okay. Because I am. Uh, <laughs> but, a, but a child who is five years old, who is nervous and insecure and already says, I can't keep up with the other people, that is an American tragedy. And a child who has momentum in kindergarten, first grade, chances are will have momentum all his or her life. An extraordinary number of folks don't have momentum. So I majored in journalism at the University of Florida. I wish I hadn't. Uh, I would have, having to do it over again, I would have majored in history. Um, I think it is that important. Um, I would. I read a lot of English literature, American literature, but I wish I had read even more. Uh, so, I know STEM education is important, um, and I want people to have a well blended education. But boy, do I think the liberal arts are important in all of this and the humanities. And I want well rounded people able to ask good questions and participate in the Republic. And if you're only focused on science and math, it's not gonna be good enough for you to be the kind of participating citizen that I would want. <laughs> Am I allowed to ask a follow-up? Sure. A follow -up Go ahead. Uh, how, how would we do that? How was that like, uh, how's that viable? Well, I, uh, it was certainly viable. Uh, when I went to University of Florida, you had to take two years of humanities. Uh, that was part of the deal. Uh, I always ask when I run into a, a, a student of late elementary or secondary school, I always ask, what books are you reading in school? Uh, and, and it's not just about books in school, it's books generally. Uh, if and when you have a family, maybe you already do, but if and when you have a family, I want you to have a lot of books in the house. I grew up in a house where a big deal for us was getting the World Book Encyclopedia. I would sit down and read the encyclopedia because it was interesting to learn things I didn't know. Uh, and maybe they fit in with other things 
uh, other things later on. So I would under, uh, emphasize a curriculum where people can be significantly participating citizens in the Republic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Fortunately, we're running short on time. I wish we could keep you all night. Um, well, so you we're can. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to move on to um, our next question. Um, and I believe Natalia was with uh, Melanie. Christina. Um, um, well, Christina Ramos was speaking uh, about leadership. If okay. we want to get into Perfect. that, into that um, realm. Christina, did you want to ask your question? Yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, perfect. So I just want to say that it was very interesting on reading about your accomplishments on how you started and where you are now. Um, I read the first few chapters of your autobiography, um, A Dedicated Life, which I believe the title speaks for itself due to um, everything you've done and the lessons you've learned throughout your life. Um, I think it's great how you your story has everything to do with kids, but um, getting to the questions, um, how do you think or what are the best ways that leaders can support other leaders, whether within the same organization or different organizations? And um, what are your other methods for inspiring others and guaranteeing that you remain inspired by the mission of the organization? So my father always used to worry that I was gonna to try to save the world. <laughs> And, and he, of course, was right. I'm not going to save the world. But I got a big opportunity, as you do, Christina, to make a huge difference in other people's lives and to set a good example. What would I want for you? I'd want you, in your own way, to set a good example. Uh, how you care about people. What difference you make for other people. Uh, I had a long conversation with a young man this morning a wonderful young man and he's 31 years old he's married he's from granada nicaragua has a two and a half year old child uh he makes 15 dollars an hour his wife makes 13 dollars an hour he deeply wants to be a pilot and you better seize the opportunity when it is anywhere near close. So we ended up in a conversation with that and agreement to meet subsequently to find out how he would find that path. And that's the opportunity you have one by one with other people who you may not even notice the effect you have on them. Uh, I'd want you to be the kind of person who celebrates other people, thanks other people, one of the stories I tell in the book is about my father dying. I was very close to my father. I went into the same business he did, which was the newspaper business. He's dying and in the hospital room. And I lean down to kiss him because I have to go by, go back to Detroit. He's in Tallahassee. And, and he said to me, my mother is there as well. I want you to know how proud your mother and I are of you. What did I want him to say? I wanted him to say, I love you. Spend more time telling people you love them. It's not a management technique. I'm not asking you to be faked and to be false, but people need love. They need to be wanted, needed, fulfilled. Um, and life can go rather suddenly. Uh, last week, I'm in a conversation with somebody on the West Coast about early childhood. What do I know? By the end of this week, the person who had seemingly had no health problems of what I'm, which I'm aware is suddenly dead. Uh, you can't get through life without substantial pain. And how you handle that pain is going to tell yourself what sort of person you are. Everything that I talk about is simple. It's not complex. 
all the important things are simple. The values you got from your mom and dad, they're going to stand you in good stead all your life if, in fact, your parents had great values. So your life is about setting an example, uh, doing things that other people say, wow, that's very special. Or one person says, my life has changed because of that. That's where the true joy in life comes about. Yep. Fantastic. I want to remind everyone that if you haven't used the reactions, uh, feel free to use applause and hearts and other <laughs> emojis. I think we just have time for one last uh, comment question, and I'll refer to you, Natalia. Yep. Um, Daniel, uh, if you, I know you had your hand up, and I know uh, it, one of the best things about this as well is that there's community members and students together because. You know, when you when you have somebody like Dave speaking, everybody wants to listen to him. Danielle, I know you had a question uh, for Dave. Well, thank you, Natalia. It's so nice to see you here. Um, okay, who am I talking with? Show me. <laughs> Who's talking? Hi. Oh, I got you. How Go are you, Dr. Lawrence? So I just wanted to say uh, thank you for Miss Caravaggio and. Natalia and, and doing these these things with with an amazing inspiring leader who intrinsically values children um, I you know you've created a legacy so I just wanted to say um, a comment I, I work with uh, as I serve as executive director for a nonprofit uh, we use uh, soccer and social emotional education to get kids active physically but also empower them to be become resilient and be civically engaged but what what i love how you propose the lifelong learning because you you bring in being being curious instead of being uh, in being in a spirit of comparison or competition so like that lifelong learning i think that is beautiful and i think um I have a nice friendship with Repa Lupus. They were presented Repa Lupus, which I know you've mentored for many years and he speaks so highly of you. Um, so I just wanted to say that I think you're brilliant in the way you bring policy together because I've noticed that you speak on the collective interest, right? So like if, for example, how you did like the, how you've done in the children's movement, which is how do I bring businesses to take care of to invest in the importance of early learning childhood education and, and, and how you created this thing of like speaking to bosses and HR departments to take care of moms that are pregnant, for example, I think this is called the babe, uh, business for baby bosses for, for babies or something babies. like that. Right. And I was like, this is so groundbreaking. This is so amazing. So I think that you always not only, you know, some people are purists, like this is what it's right but you are more like a pragmatist where you find, okay, this is what's right, but how do I sell it? And I make it like what you said earlier, how do I make it collectively? And I think a lot of times in the, in the civic, civically involved, we wanna fight for what's right, but we don't find narratives that kind of blend everyone together. And so you, you brought in capitalism, like how, how, how not investing in early childhood education is gonna affect you know, like the, the future, the finance. So you bring in the money component so that people can stay saying, okay, this is important. So I think that's, I, I just, it's not a question. It's more like praise so, to what you're let me doing. Let me make a couple of comments on this. First of all, I think that's a lot of wisdom in what you're saying. Uh, I, I urge you to remember, all of us to remember, it's hard to know where you are in history when you're living it. Uh, so how does this all work its way out? I don't know. Um, but you could go back through history and how did you know what you were doing on women's suffrage or social security, which was fought as Marxism at the beginning or suffrage was fought in the early years of the last century was fought as what do these people want? Uh, stay home and do some things and you'll be a contributor to the family and society. Uh, you also got to be, and you raise this point, you also have to see that this is about evolution, not revolution. Uh, 
I'd like things to be perfect. And frankly, I can tell you how they could kind of be perfect, but they're not going to be perfect. And so you need to do it in an evolutionary way. You need to go fast enough for real progress and slow enough to keep people with you. Uh, so I don't claim to have the um, um, all, anywhere near all the answers. I know I have a strong sense without being self-righteous of what, what is good and fair and, and just, but I have to learn myself and I can think of things in history in my lifetime that I had a different view on back when than I do now. That's called, I think, maturing. It's called growth and, and so forth. And again, to go back to Horace Mann, you know, uh, what difference have you made? Uh, that's, that is the real, um, the real joy in life. And it's there to be done. Um, and at times it's a little scary. And at times you don't know if you can do it. Um, much of my work is sort of underground. Uh, I don't need to get big press releases on anything. Uh, I was certainly aware that the Children's Trust would, had been sort of a disastrous attempt 14 years before. Well, well, could you actually get this passed? And we did polling, spent a bunch of money on polling. Well, what did the polling show? It showed that we could get 40%. Well, 40%, you're not going to win an election. So what do you need to do to win the election? One of the things we needed to win the election was to tell people, among other things, try it for a few years. If you don't like it, we can dump it. Uh, so again, this is, to me, all of this, your life and mine is about what would be fundamentally decent, fair, and just in the United States of America. Uh, People talk all the time about exceptionalism in this country. It comes up every four-year political season. Uh, well, well, what makes this country exceptional is not that, that we're the smartest people anywhere. It's certainly not that we have more billionaires. It's certainly not that we have more weapons than anybody else. What makes this country exceptional is at times that we have wanted to do good things. We're a very generous country. We're a very charitable country. Uh, but we are full of our own human flaws and, and, and we've made a lot of mistakes. Do we learn from those mistakes? How actually do we overcome racism? We've made progress. But I cannot believe that Dr. King would say, uh, who died in 1968, I cannot believe that he would say um, 50 plus years later, oh, wow, look at all the progress America has made. Because we're a long way from any promised land. But I, I'm going to leave my whole life thinking we can make progress getting there. We're trying to do something in this country that no other country has achieved. Uh, it's there to be done. Don't tell me it's been done in Cuba. Uh, and don't start giving me stories, and I'm not talking to you here specifically, but don't start telling me about Antonio Maceo and way back in the, in the, um, in the Cuban revolution that we had a black general, therefore um, everything has uh, changed from that point on didn't happen. Look at examples throughout the whole world. We're a good people, but we can be a better people than we are. And that's what Maurice Ferre's life was all about. Uh, and I suspect it's the people that you most want to emulate and, and you have the chance to do it. You have a chance to make an enormous difference for other human beings. Thank you so much. What an uplifting way to, to conclude. I really regret that we're running out of time. I, if it wasn't for Zoom fatigue, I'd keep you on here all night. <laughs> uh, well, let me, let me say one last thing. Which yeah, of course. Anyone after reading the book wants to sit down and talk with me, I'm easy to reach. 
uh, and all you would need to do is to ask the professor, what's his cell phone number and what's his email? And she'd give it to you. So if you read the book, you want to sit down, I'll be glad to sign it personally. I'll be glad to talk to you about all of this individually. So if you want to do that, get the information from the professor and I'll be delighted to do it. How lucky are all of you. Well, this has definitely been such a treat. Um, thank you again so much for taking time out of your evening to share um, just really so much knowledge, um, wisdom, inspiration. It's definitely very much appreciated. Um, I just want to definitely acknowledge as well uh, the Children's Trust. Um, thank you um, as well. If you aren't familiar with it, definitely look it up. And um, within the chat, also check out his book, as you mentioned. And if you have any questions, please reach out to me. I'll be happy to connect you and get you that autograph in your copy. I um, also want to thank the Jack D. Gordon Institute for Public Policy and the uh, Department of Public Policy and Administration. Um, I'm posting in the chat a link to the Frey Institute. Please connect with us and reach out if you have any questions or concerns. Um, we're looking forward to our upcoming speaker series and just want to thank you again for your time. I hope everyone, if you have the reactions, please join me in a round of applause and thanking again, um, Mr. Lawrence for his time. Thank you. And Dave, if you could stay on for just a beat, um, I just know that uh, the, the professor and I just wanted to touch base. I'll be glad to. Students in PAD 4934 have any questions? Um, just as a reminder, next week we'll be meeting with FIU librarian, uh, Lori Driver, who will go over the um, resource page that was created on how to conduct academic research. And we'll also be spending some time in our next class as well in breakouts um, with our group so you'll get to know your other group members. The librarian has a tough act to follow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, Professor Caraballo and um, Natalia and um, David. Um, this was a very, very inspiring lecture. I think thank I speak you. on behalf of everyone. Thank, thank you. you so much. And thank you for your great questions. So with that being said, class excused. Um, I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you again for, for logging in, for being engaged, and just for your fantastic questions. And as always, if you have any questions or concerns in the meantime, please don't hesitate to reach out to Natalia and I. And thank you again to everyone for joining us this evening. I'm going to stop recording at this point. <laughs>